Good afternoon. I am Ami Sarnowski, Chief Innovation Officer at Genesis 10. On behalf of Genesis 10, welcome to today's roundtable discussion, Women in Technology, What Can We Do Now? To delve into this important topic that will affect our workplace for generations, we have invited this distinguished panel to share their perspective. Please join me in welcoming Mandy O'Dell, Vice President, Head of HR Tech for Technology with Northwestern Mutual. Eric Simonson, Managing Partner of Research at Everest Group. And Terry Hogan, President and CTO for the National Center for Women and in Information Technology. For the past several years, diversity, equity, and inclusion have become a priority in organizations. I do think it is fascinating how the mindset and focus has evolved from just five years ago. The Huffington Post published an article back in 2017 highlighting the importance of diversity and inclusion because it made sense for a business's bottom line. The article noted that a diverse workforce was important to drive innovation, attract more talent, and create more opportunities for growth. So very much a business motivated reason. Fast forward, the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, and even the passing of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg have moved us past the business motivation to social justice and to focus on equity, not just in our workplace, but also in our communities. Today's roundtable discussion is focused on raising awareness for women in technology and spurring conversation to move past barriers, and more importantly, to, to equip each of us to help move our companies forward. Before we get started, if anyone has any technical difficulties or any questions that they would like to ask the panelists, please use the chat feature. We will be taking questions at the end of today's discussion. To start off, I would like to ask Terry Hogan to provide context on the genesis of the gender gap. How did we even get here? Terry? Thank you, Ami. It is great to be here. And thanks to Genesis 10 for hosting this roundtable discussion. I'm going to share my screen with you here so we can look through a few slides and talk about um, like you said, how we got here. My name, as you know, is Terry Hogan. I'm the president and CTO at NCWIT. And NCWIT is a nonprofit organization oops, that was founded in 2004 with a grant from the National Science Foundation. And our mission is to increase the meaningful and influential particip participation of all women at all intersections in the field of computing especially in terms of innovation and development. So it's really about having women contributing to all phases of the phases of the innovation process within our technical companies and also within technical groups of other companies that may not consider themselves tech. Oftentimes we talk to organizations who want to understand more why diversity is so important and why it's such a hot topic these days. And one of the reasons it's so important is that we know from research that groups with greater diversity solve problems faster and better than homogenous groups. There is a reference here that anyone who's interested can look at. It's a book published by Scott Page that talks about the difference in homogenous and diverse groups in terms of how they solve problems. And it's quite interesting. And the numbers are not so great today. So the way that we are addressing technical problems in our culture is somewhat homogenous. You can see on this slide that women do comprise more than half of all professional occupations in the US today. However, these numbers decrease when you look at technical jobs and they look even more terrible when you look at women of color. Uh, you can see in this slide that when Hispanic women only make up 2% of the entire computing workforce, which is pretty dismal. Additionally, for leadership positions within tech, the numbers are quite bad. Only 5% of CTOs in the Fortune 1000 companies are women. This impacts innovation in a variety of different ways, but one of the ways that you can think about innovation and how we know what impact we're having is if you look at patenting data. So this quite complicated slide uh, is really showing you the way patenting data shows that our IT patents are largely created by one group of people today. This is approximately a 30 year time span. And if you look at the very bottom right hand corner, you'll see that 
the men only teams have created 87.4% of all technology patent information technology patents. Now we would never stand for this in any other part of our society. We would never stand for it if 87.4% of our music was created by women or if 87.4% of our art was created by men. And we shouldn't stand for it in tech either. So as you mentioned earlier, we wanna talk briefly about why this is happening. And I'm not going to do this section justice because I only have a few minutes, um, but NCWIT is a research-based organization and we have a team of social scientists who study this very problem, why it's happening and how we can make a difference. And I am happy to follow up with anybody after this call um, to talk more about this in more detail. And also, I am not a social scientist, I am a computer scientist. So you're going to be getting the computer scientist read on a social science problem. Um, and again, I'm happy to follow up and talk with people further about it later. So why is this happening? Well, at NCWIT, one of the ways we talk about this is that minority groups are not broken and majority groups are not the enemy. The culprit is societal bias, and it is shared by both women and men. We are all biased when it comes to who does tech. There's actually an online bias checker that you can take, which is, um, I can send a link to that later, but you can take an online bias checker that looks at your own attitudes, unconscious, about women in tech. And I have taken this bias checker um, I took it when I first started at NCWIT and I came out as moderately biased against women in tech. And I am a woman in tech. <laughs> and so this is something that we all share, which means that we can all work on this together. So what causes these biases? Just real quick, we'll talk about this. Societal biases are actually caused by something called schemas. And these schemas are shortcuts that we have in our minds that help us interpret our world. But sometimes because they are shortcuts, they make us misinterpret things. And that is unconscious bias. An example of a schema that I like to give is if you think about being in a car and driving down the highway and you see a collection of buildings and parking lots off to the side of the road on the highway, you know just at a glance that that is a mall, for example because you have a schema in your head for what a mall looks like. If you didn't have schemas, every single time you drove by a mall, you would be so surprised and your brain would be working really hard trying to figure out what that was because you would drive by it and you'd say, oh my goodness, what is that collection of buildings and cars? Because you wouldn't have a schema. And then five miles later, you'd drive by another one and you'd say, oh my goodness, what is that collection of buildings and cars? Because you don't have a schema. But again, we might make mistakes. So you might have in your head a schema for what a leader looks like or what a technical person looks like. And that might accidentally make you miss something or make a mistake about someone who doesn't fit your schema. But the good news is that schemas can be expanded. So once a person adds another type of person into their schema for who might be a leader or who might be a technical person, that schema has been expanded. These biases get brought to work. So our society, our people, we have biases, we bring them to work. And when we bring them to work, we write business processes that have bias in them because we of course are biased human beings and that affects our organiza organizational cultures. I'm gonna give just one quick example of how this shows up. Um, this particular slide, we have a couple uh, that are similar to this, but this particular slide is one that I pulled out there's a woman named Heidi Roizen, who's a quite famous entrepreneur in California. And they took her resume and they gave a class of MBA students, so young people, her resume. And they gave one version of it with her name on it as Heidi and one version with her name on it as Howard. And they asked the students many questions. Three of the questions you see here how power hungry, self-promoting or disingenuous were Howard and were Heidi. And you can see here across the board that with the exact same resume, just with a different name, Heidi was perceived as more power hungry, more self-promoting, more disingenuous. There's another slide that shows that people do not wanna hire Heidi, but they do wanna hire Howard with an identical resume. 
this is one of the impacts of the biases we have in our culture because we expect women to be one way and we expect men to be another way. And sometimes women get punished for being more like the men. It also shows up in other ways in our offices. For another example here is something that you might hear in a meeting where someone says, actually, Susan has a good idea. Like they're so surprised. They can't believe Susan has a good idea. Actually, that's a good idea. Uh, women are more commonly interrupted in meetings. Their ideas are more, more commonly ignored in meetings. They additionally are sometimes asked if they're, they're even in the right meeting. Are you in the right meeting? And they're required to produce credentials and proof of contribution more often than their male counterparts. There's another phenomenon that's kind of an isolation problem where often women carry more of the burden of outside of work responsibilities in the home. And when things happen at the Friday night beer bash, many times women are not invited or were invited but are unable to attend. Um, here's another example that I'm going to give real quick because I know I don't have a whole lot of time left. Um, and that is that women and other types of underrepresented populations often suffer from what's called stereotype threat. You may have heard of stereotype threat, but it is when essentially a group, a person who is a part of a group has a fear that they're going to reinforce a negative stereotype about their group and that makes them behave more poorly. So this, the group that is least likely to suffer from stereotype threat in our culture at least is white males. And so there was a study done by Dr. Joshua Aronson where he wanted to evoke stereotype threat in white males to see how he could do it. And it turns out it's quite easy to evoke it in anyone and what he did in this particular example is he had white male engineering students from Stanford come together into a room to take a math test. And he divided the students into two different groups. And one of the groups of students, he told them that they were simply giving, taking a math test in order to understand their math performance. The second group, they told them that they were being given a math test because they were trying to understand why Asian students typically do better on math tests than white students. All they did was plant that seed that those students were not as good as someone else and the performance of those students dropped by about 30%. All right, so this shows up in workplaces as well in quite common ways. It shows up as people being reluctant to defend their ideas. People are nervous about speaking up and taking on a leadership position. They're often overly harsh about their own work and they often discount their own performance. They say things like, well, I had a lot of help on this. I didn't do this myself. Or I only got 98% of these things correct, not 100% of these things correct. It's not really good enough. So these are some of the ways that these show up. Um, in the PDF version of these slides that you'll receive later, there are some tips about how people can make a difference in their own workplaces. But for now, I will step out of this presentation because my job here was to just set a little context for folks and we'll roll right in. Thank you so much, Terry. Eric, Mandy, thoughts or additional roadblocks that you find um, either Eric, you know, as you're talking with clients um, in terms of roadblocks that you see that are affecting others to close the gender gap. Eric, do you want to start? And then Mandy, do you want to follow? Sure. Um, Eric Simonson, um, just quickly, I work for a company called Everest Group that does research and consulting in um, IT and business process area. And that includes things like services and sourcing models. There's a part of that we cover a lot of talent topics. Um, how do people actually get the work done? And so that's kind of my... Um, my kind of ticket into why we observe some of these, these trends and topics. Um, I think, uh, first of all, I'm Terry, excellent, excellent presentation. I was taking a lot of notes and can't wait to, to get the, um, the PDF. Um, I think a lot of what um, we see, and this is just a, there's sort of um, what happens after someone joins the workforce, but actually just getting them into the workforce. The big thing a bunch of people at least initially struggling with is just getting people into the workforce, which was, um, 
uh, kind of first part of Terry's Terry's uh, slides. And um, we're actually seeing, um, in addition to the innovation dimension that Terry mentioned, there is just general scarcity of talent at this point, and there is and there's more openness to alternative backgrounds. Do we really need college grads? Can we um, reskill, upskill people, et cetera? And so um, we're seeing as there's digital transformation and organizations needing more, um, uh, more, um, more capacity that they're, uh, they're willing to stretch the norms and try new things. I think very few of them will have dealt with sort of what was the second part of Terry's um, context, which is, okay, once you get people in the door, how do you behave? Right. And we'll come to that, I think, a bit later. And there's you know, tremendous things that are friction points on that. And I'd say you know, some of it is just how is work packaged and done? How do decisions get made? How are people engaged on that? Um, and there's many subtle things that we all um, can accidentally do or constrain a role model that um, um, on reflection are quite silly. Yeah, and I would just add on to that from a, a rewriting the rules perspective. Obviously, in my role as, as head of HR for a technology organization, I get very close to the talent processes and talent practices that are cyclical and most big companies um, will, will do for their talent. Um, in, in thinking about how, how some of those processes are, are done and have been historically done, it almost um, requires well roadblock in the sense that things like the referral bonus. You know, many companies have, have used referral bonuses and considered a best practice um, to get people to share, um, you know, th their network for for roles that are open. In doing so, though, you end up with a lot of people who are like the people you already have. So if you struggle with a diverse workplace, and those people are bringing in more people that are just like them. Um, it might actually hurt your efforts. So yes, you may get people in the door quickly, but will they be the most diverse? Maybe not. So I think it, you know, one roadblock could be just the, the tried and true talent practices of organizations um, and, and kind of rewriting those rules and rewriting those practices to create a more diverse workforce is something that we need to do. Those are great observations. Um, it's interesting. One of the things that we'll be talking about um, during this conversation is how do you start to look outside of the norm um, and really start to tap into those diverse skill sets. Um, so we'll touch upon that uh, in, in the coming conversation. Mandy, would you like to talk a little bit about how the pandemic has impacted working women? How can employers prevent a setback in gender parity in the workplace? Absolutely. So interestingly, you know, studies show, statistics have shown over, over time that women in the workplace actually report higher levels of, of anxiety and depress, depression than men. Um, there have been many studies that have come out since, since COVID-19 and, and you know, all of this started. One of them I'd hone in on is by the University of Southern California. What they observed from their survey participants is that there was there was actually a huge a huge spike um, in those psychological um, kind of responses from women versus men at the beginning of, of the pandemic. Um, at the beginning, especially for women who have caregiving responsibilities, there was a pretty dramatic spike. Um, the, you know, another kind of thing that I pull out of the study is that about forty four percent of women in early April reported being the only household member providing childcare compared to 14% of men. And then by early June, 64% of college educated mothers reported that they had reduced their working hours at some point since March versus 36% of college educated fathers. Um, even college educated mothers, or I'm sorry, college educated women without young children had reduced their hours and you know, in response to maybe that some of that psychological distress that, that they were experiencing. Um, so it's very real that there has been an, a greater impact um, on women in the workplace as a result of the pandemic. Um, some thoughts for how employers can maybe prevent a setback would be um, considering policies and practices, um, considering a, a adjusting them. So something that we've done is we took another look at our flexible work arrangement policy. 
And we really made sure that all of our managers were up to date and understood that we do have a flexible work arrangement policy and to encourage them to, um, to allow more of those. Um, we also rolled out several work-life balance practices and, and really got our executive leaders and, and kind of cascade on the organization to adopt those. Things like, you know, reserve your Friday afternoons um, for just work time, no scheduling meetings on Friday afternoons, no meetings after five, um, you know, certain practices like that have really helped at least our workforce. Um, kind of referring back to the talent processes and practices I mentioned earlier, right now, many of us are going through the year end process, you know, the year end performance rating process. And I would say, you know, make sure in all of those talent processes that you're really paying attention to the female, you know, ratings, the female scores, you know, how many females are considered high potential. Um, like pay attention to the data and try to, to dig in and see if there are any themes and if there's anything that can be done. Um, and then, you know, the other thing I would mention is as you're looking at any hiring job movement promotion activity that's going on, um, you know, once again, pay attention to the data, pay attention to, um, you know, how women are faring through the pandemic. Um, is there as, you know, as many women being promoted and ask yourself, why not be sensitive to the fact that women are experiencing more obligation outside of the workplace um, and, and take a more indiv you know, individualized approach versus maybe the kind of the blanket process approach that you might have applied in the past. Mandy, do you find that sometimes people might be afraid to ask for a flexible working arrangement or to just even talk about some of the stress that they're having both, you know, because of the pandemic outside of the work environment? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, as an, as an HR leader, I'll have people come to me that say, you know, I don't feel like I could talk to my manager about this. And so hopefully there, you know, you have good HR partners and an HR organization that can help with some of that. Mm -hmm. um, for, for the leaders on the line here, I would say emulate the behaviors, show people that it's okay. Um, don't just tell them it's okay, but really show them that you yourself are going to take your Friday afternoons for no meetings. Um, I think that goes a long way as well. That's a really good point. Um, Eric, I know in probably maybe four or six weeks ago, you and I chatted about the future of work and the hybrid work model that is kind of evolving as a result of the pandemic. Thoughts on the role that how companies will be can be moving towards that hybrid work model and how that could actually help create a more balanced experience for the working woman. Okay, so um, what, uh, what uh, Terry covered and then Mandy um, were two um, um, uncomfortable pictures of the reality of both what, what, what existed before COVID and, and how things have even evolved since then. Um, uh, although I acknowledge that that's probably the reality um, as an observer of kind of how things change. Um, I like to think that this disruption we've been through actually gives us an opportunity to, to create a more, more change. And so I'll have a little bit more of a, a bullish of what can we, what can we really, what can we really do? Um, I kind of think about this along two, two dimensions. One is the sandbox of what's possible. We have some chance to expand the edges of that sandbox. And I'll, I'll go into some of that. And the second thing is, I think just behaviorally, there's some tactics that are good anyway, but now is a particularly great time to, to step back and think about them. In terms of ways to expand the sandbox, um, I think the first is when you're thinking about how to address some of these challenges, and in effect, um, as, um, as uh, Ami said, the, the, the work from home creates a degree of potential flexibility. Don't don't think about we're solving the problem for women. Think about we're trying to use that in general. So make it a broad, a broad um, opportunity of lots of people have things where their where their life pressures and their per personal um, professional um, expectations may come into conflict or may need to be mixed up into in new patterns. Um, so so think broadly about that and across life stages. The second thing is, you know, recognize that it, not only is it a unique time where we've been disrupted, um, 
naturally because of the duration of this and how fundamental it is, it is a time where we're able to deliver, I'm sorry, develop new habits and we still have time to continue to develop new habits. So even though we may have gotten into some habits that aren't quite right, as we start to come out of it, um, more kids are back in school, et cetera. There's, there's a lot of things that if we you know, work on um, thinking about what are the opportunities to really um, take this time that's you know, probably, let's just call it at least four months, probably nine months, maybe 12 months more sort of coming out of this, that we can be experimenting, we can be, um, we can be trying to form new ways of doing things that in the past people would have said you were, you're out of your gourd to suggest. Um, third, um, think broadly about the, the role models and, and in particular um, in, involve the males um, on this. I think what, we're, what you're trying to do is you step back across all this is we're trying to both in some ways not only re-engineer roles, which is maybe how this is often thought about, we also have a chance to re-engineer how we get work done. Um, and can you package it differently? Are there four day work weeks? Are there different shifts? Are there different ways you, you create meetings, um, decision making, et cetera? So I think look at that and the, and the role models um, I think are an important thing to find out who can be a, a collaborator within this. In terms of just kind of some tactical things, um, and a lot of these almost sound like the stuff that you potentially went through in um, your first, um, some of your first training out, out of college were like meeting hygiene. How should you run meetings? How should you um, take notes? Do you record it, pre-reads, et cetera? It's a great chance to step back and think about that. And is it working well? And if you're trying to in, in develop flexibility and, and create good behaviors, you know, are you really doing things in the way you should? Um, um, second is think about shaping the return to office um, approach. Um, so there's gonna be a period where most companies will end up in this hybrid model. They're not gonna be purely work from home or purely office bound. So how does the return to office look? Um, what are the hours that are expected? Is walking the hallways become important? How do people, how do people dress? How do they do meetings? You know, how, do you, how do you use the return to office in the way you adjust a lot of subtle, subtle things? Um, and then I think it's finally, I think it's important to not just role model, but ask people who are dealing with certain situations and, um, across the organization to share their own best practices, maybe capture it on a video, maybe have a town hall, but be specific. You know, this is uh, an elderly parent that needs care. This is a special needs child. This is you know, handling lots of children. This is you know, going through a release for a new product where things were crazy. And sort of what did people do? So trying to help give people life hacks and so people can kind of see the craziness we're often all managing <laughs> behind the curtain that, that often now kind of creeps in front of the curtain a little bit, um, but just be more authentic about what those things are. So. Those are great points, Eric. And I think one of the things that you commented on early on is the unintended consequence, right? It's, it's about managing equity in the workplace. Um, obviously today we're talking about women, but the unintended consequence is that hyper-focus on one gender could create that um, inequity, if you will. So I think that's also um, a really important point as, as all of us really need to kind of broaden our mindset. Yeah. And I, would, um, I, would even, I would even go as far as to say, you might be able to stimulate demand from say the male population on why they want work to be more flexible for them. Mm -hmm. Like what, what, are the, what would they like to be able to balance or handle differently, assuming that they don't have some of the, um, you know, some of the other demands. So it's a, it's a chance to maybe in general, make work work better for everyone. Absolutely. Terry, additional thoughts or observations that you'd like to share? Yeah, I wanted to comment on a couple things. One thing that was just said by Eric that I think is great is that you don't improve the work culture for one group, you improve the work culture for all groups. And so this idea that we're making something better for women is really not right. Just like Eric said, we're making things better for all people by thinking about how we make things better for one group of people. And that's a really important thing to remember. Sometimes we get into the habit of saying, how can I make things better for someone else? But really you're making it better for everyone. And then the other thing I wanted to say is that I really appreciate the way that Mandy and Eric were both talking about the intentionality of all of this and the creativity of all of it. So being very intentional about what we're doing as we work remotely, as well as once we're coming back, how we do that and being creative 
in how we attack the problems that we're facing today that we may not have had before. Um, I think those are both really important pieces to all of it. NCWIT talks a lot about using a spirit of inquiry as we're looking at our cultures and as we're looking at our organizations. Let's use that sort of open-minded concept of asking questions. What is it this person needs? What is, this, what is it this person thinks when someone says something? Let's ask a further, further follow-up question to make sure we really understand where these things are coming from as we're moving forward. Thanks, Terry. One of the things, I'm gonna take us back um, to at the very beginning of the discussion when I think it was Eric that mentioned that there's just an overall talent shortage um, and that we really as, as employers have to really start to think creatively and broaden how we approach the, um, how we approach talent in and of itself because there's just not enough supply, if you will, not enough resources. I wanted to invite Mackenzie Peters into the conversation. Um, I had an opportunity to meet with Mackenzie. She is a, De a Genesis 10 Dev 10 associate. Um, she has a pretty neat story um, and one that I think many of us can relate to either as parents. Um, I myself had my daughter graduated during the pandemic. So one of the things that I wanted to highlight around Mackenzie is that she, she graduated during the pandemic as a graphics designer, but realized very late in her college career that her passion was actually coding. She wanted to get into the technology arena. Oddly enough, the encouragement for Mackenzie did not come from a mentor, didn't come from her parents, it didn't come from a college counselor, but rather it was because of a couple of required classes that she had to take that really sparked the interest for Mackenzie to consider changing career paths and to pursue a career in coding. Early on, we also, someone had commented about, you know, emulate the behaviors. Um, and I also take that extended a little bit further, not only as leaders, but as mentors. Um, and so Mackenzie, I'd love to um, ask you what advice you would have for young professionals who might find themselves in similar shoes where they're charting down a path that is not best suited and they want to make that career change. Sure. Yeah, I guess my biggest piece of advice that I would give is to really invest in yourself and, you know, in, investing in yourself, it can mean different things to each individual, whether it's investing time or money or resources that you have. Um, you have to, you have to really invest in yourself. For me, this meant realizing that it was time to make a pivot in my career path. Um, as you mentioned, I was in my junior year of my degree in, in graphic design when I had the opportunity to take some, uh, some web courses in web design. It was through these courses that I realized I had an affinity for coding, but being on years four and five of my degree, it meant that I either had to commit to four more years of college or try to find an alternative pathway into the tech space. So in looking for that pathway, I discovered an internship at a local tech recruiting firm in Milwaukee. And I spent my uh, senior year of college working at that firm and taking any opportunity I could to apply for tech positions and grow my knowledge base. Uh, working in recruiting really gave me a unique position to understand the, the technical job market in Milwaukee, especially when it came to the gender gap that exists. I was really surprised by how few women I interviewed, especially when those that I did interview often stood out to me the most. Um, seeing this sort of gap and seeing that the women stood out to me more often than not actually ended up motivating me to continue down this path towards my goal of becoming a developer because I knew that my background was unique, interesting, and that I could bring something new to the table. Thankfully, I found the Dev 10 program at Genesis 10 and I chose to invest uh, three months of my time into this program to receive uh, paid training in Java development and I began working at one of the top employers in Milwaukee the day after I graduated from the program. So all of this is to say that even, even if I, you know, even me being in my last year of college, it, it wasn't too late for me to pivot. And it's really not too late for anyone, no matter where they're at in their lives. Investing in yourself is always still an option. 
Thank you for sharing your story, Mackenzie. Thank when you. we spoke, um, you also talked about some ideas that you shared at the university. Can you comment on that a little? Yeah, so um, I, at, at, when I was in college, I brought to my advisor, once I had realized that this was sort of the path I wanted to go to, um, that I, I wanted to go down this path. And I noticed that the courses that they offered in the graphics design program were a bit outdated in the languages that they taught. In that if they, instead of teaching PHP, taught JavaScript, many people um, who graduated from my program would have had the option of going into a career in front-end development with the skills that they would have learned if they took those courses as well. And the idea was sort of shot down and dismissed. You know, they, they had their curriculum set. They didn't want to change it. Um, and they instead offered me to, you know, reapply or, or go back to school for uh, computer science for another four years, which wasn't the best option for me. So I, I was definitely disappointed in the university a little bit and on that matter. I, that I found really surprising is that there's not a broader discussion, just even from an advisory standpoint. Um, it just seems to me that we need to be um, forging a tighter relationship, both uh, from a, a corporate, corporate America standpoint but with the universities, but also cascading that into the elementary schools and the middle schools and high schools as well. I don't know, Terry, if, if you have any uh, thoughts or comments about that. Yeah, so there's several different ways to think about uh, this idea of bringing out more computing opportunities for students across that entire pipeline. Um, one of the ways that we think about that is through professional school counselors and making sure that they are well equipped to talk to students about computing careers and options for them as they're moving through their educational um, choices. We know that counselors play a very big role in helping students think about what classes they should take, not only while they're in school, in high school or middle school, but also once they get to college, they help them choose which schools to look at, which majors to choose, things like that. So NC WIT works hard to work with school counselors to help them understand computing as an option and make sure that they feel comfortable um, providing that as an option for different students. So that's one piece. And then there's another piece, which is the computing curriculum itself in school and making sure that the cu curriculum itself is inclusive in the way it's being brought to students and taught. And there are lots of different uh, sort of frameworks out there about engaging curriculum and teaching students in an engaging inclusive way. And all of those are really important. The recent changes that have been made to the CSAP curriculum have made some pretty big improvements similar to the way that Mackenzie was talking about, you know, learning PHP instead of JavaScript. The CSAP principles class has had a quite good track rate of having underrepresented students taking that class across the country. So they've seen pretty good improvement there, but making sure we're thinking about curriculum and who we're inviting to take it is a really important part of this. I know for myself as a parent, I'm a huge proponent um, about exposure and just trying because that's the way that you realize it kind of goes back to Mackenzie's story. When she had to, she was forced in this case because she had a class she had to take. But once she you know, was able, had the opportunity to uh, dabble, if you will, then she realized. Mandy, um, I know in Milwaukee, there is a tech hub that you are a part of. Do you want to share a little bit about what, um, what you and Northwestern Mutual and, and the Milwaukee Tech Hub are, are leading the way? Sure, you know what resonated with me and, and does connect to this is the you know the corporate allyship piece that you mentioned, Nami. Um, there's I, I believe that it's it's it, it really is a, a major responsibility of corporations in their local markets, basically wherever they're trying to, to acquire talent from, um, to forge a relationship with universities, to forge a relationship with other corporations in the area and try to build those pipelines. Um, so that's, you know, really is a big, a big piece of what um, our relationship, Northwestern Mutual's relationship with NK Tech, Tech Hub is all about. Um, and actually, I know Laura is here on the line. I don't know if Laura, um, who happens to lead the uh, Tech Hub, I'm sorry, the NK Hub Coalition, would like to say anything. Oh, you're muted. 
No, I think I'm on. Um, there you go. Yes. Um, no, I, we we are so thankful for Northwestern Mutual to sort of lead the way. Um, they started the Tech Up Coalition as a collective impact framework in 2017, and then it was reorganized into a nonprofit in 2019. And at that time, um, we hired uh, Kathy Heinrich as our first CEO, so we were excited to have a woman in tech get hired for that position, and then she asked me to join her in April. So. Uh, we're really excited about all the work we're doing. We have 67 members and Northwestern Mutual is on our board and continues to provide unbelievable support and uh, thought leadership. So thank you for that. And I, I would be remiss if I did not reach out and say thank you to Gen 10 and Dev 10 through, um, through the work that they're doing. They're part of our preferred reskilling provider network for the coalition. And so we're so excited to have them part of that process. Thanks, Laura. I'm gonna to segue to uh, take us down a different path in the discussion, um, kind of pivot over to data. So Terry, this is going to be a two-part question. Companies like Apple, Facebook, Google, and Microsoft have started to publish annual diversity reports. From your perspective, what role does data disclosure play? And then beyond data disclosure, are there other levers that could create meaningful change? Yeah, data disclosure is an important part of making sure that we're tracking how change is happening. And I want to comment on data disclosure in a couple of ways. The first is that one thing that we need to keep in mind is that numbers of employees is a trailing indicator of change. And so when we look at numbers of employees, that's not the first thing that's going to change. The first thing that's going to change is your culture in your organization. And so our member organizations, we work with them to look at ways of measuring change along the way while they're also looking to change the numbers of employees because the culture has to change first before your employees are going to be more likely to stay, before they're going to be more likely to be hired. And so we do think data disclosure is important and we have some resources about transparency and how you can look at evaluation data and how you can gather data and track it and report it. Um, but there's nuance to it. And another piece of that nuance is also understanding what work the women are doing within your organization and what work the other underrepresented populations are doing in your organization. It's important to look at sub-segregation of roles, which is quite common in technology organizations where maybe the number, pure number of women or un other underrepresented populations in your organization is quite even, but what are they doing? Let's make sure that it's not that all of the women are your project managers and your testers and that the men are the architects. Let's make sure that the women and men are both architects and they're both testers and they're both project managers. It's a really important piece that's also quite nuanced and doesn't typically happen in a data transparency initiative by an organization, but it's something that we encourage um, and see what it does with our member organizations. So that's one piece. And then the second part of your question was about what other things do we think about? And that for me is related to the beginning of the answer I gave about culture. We need to not get into this place where all we do is think about the numbers. Um, we can make bad decisions when the first thing we think about is what number of women do I have on my team? That can drive the wrong kind of decision um, because it sometimes drives us to hire people that maybe we wouldn't have hired in another scenario, right? It's not about just get the number up. It's not enough. It's really about building an inclusive culture and setting the groundwork for making it so that women want to be there and that they want to stay. I also think sometimes the numbers can uh, also create a, um, a mask or a facade right around the issue. And I think the point that you made around what, what type of work are these women or the underrepresented doing? Because I think that's where you can create that facade and it's a play on numbers because if they are more performing at the mid or lower level, but they're not represented at the leadership, then it goes back to the earlier part of the conversation around emulating behavior. That's um, right. Mandy, thoughts or additional comments? Yeah, thank you for asking. I was, I was going to chime in. You know, I'm, I'm a big, um, big fan of data. I really use data to inform a lot of what we do from a talent and culture perspective um, in, in my organization. 
I would say where you go wrong with data when it comes to DNI is is keeping that macro view because to Terry's point, um, you might say overall our you know our women picture looks pretty good, but when you start clicking in, is when things fall apart. So we tend to track everything from you know how many you know actual promotions of a certain you know of software engineers at this level have we seen um, across all demographics. So really, you're, you're needing to kind of double and triple click down into the data in order to make it useful. Looking at those macro numbers that you might see in some of these diversity reports is often not very helpful. No, absolutely. Eric, any additional thoughts before we go on? Yeah, just would underscore that I think the data is very valuable from the standpoint of if you have enough of it, it's rich enough, it allows you to ask more questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we've at this point just spoken largely about the employees, but that obviously can extend up into the recruiting engine, the interns, a whole bunch of things that then can start to have people, well, are we only looking in certain places and that the, the bias that was mentioned on the um, you know, referrals, is that causing some of this or is, you know, are we constraining the role to certain requirements that somehow you know, causes, causes some skew in how we do things? I think it's at least, my personal experience is if you don't try to look at the data, then people don't set the problem up to be solved as rigorously as if they, as if they said, oh, wow, you know, that's only 10%. Why can't that be a third? Okay, mm -hmm. I mean, a third may not be the great final answer, but a third is better than 10%. You know, let's, let's go do that. So you can use the data to create focus. But then back to Mandy's point, you've got to peel the onion back and really get dig into the details. Um, otherwise, the data can actually mask what the, re what the reality is. So the final question, because I do want to leave a few minutes for questions from uh, the attendees, from the audience. And it goes back to a comment that Terry made around the culture. Um, so if a company has a diverse workforce, does it necessarily mean that they have an inclusive workforce too? How can we create a sense of belonging? Eric, you want to share your thoughts first? And then I'd like to pivot to yeah. ask all of the panel. Yeah, sure. So, so I think it, it, the short answer is just having the, a mix of people doesn't mean what you're getting out of that mix of people is the benefit you wanted. Um, and, and I think to get the value out of the diversity, there's there's two two things I tend to think think about where you're really getting the best out of people. One um, we spoke about already, which is kind of innovation and the opportunity to, to create, to understand new needs, to build new things, et cetera. The other is kind of to establish a direction, to, to shape where things are headed, so decision-making. And I think um, to get to these things, there's many different little behaviors um, that are critical into how you operate. And there were six that I um, thought of that I think people can really reflect back on to, to think about are, are, the, are we getting, are they happening the way they should? So how do we communicate? How do we make decisions? How do we, what roles do people fall into in meetings? How do we delegate? How do we set project charters? So how do we actually really you know, structure how we, have, how we go after work? How do we do staffing? And then um, you know, how helpful are we really in coaching and development of people dealing with some of these things? So just, hey, you need to be more inclusive or is it, really helping people crack the code. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of things where I think you can change up how you do some of those things in subtle ways that can help help you um, uh, make it easier for people to um, not uh, self-limit, uh, to create you know, deeper roles um, for you know, maybe people who aren't used to being expected to play that role, but it gives people a chance, uh, more data points, et cetera. Those are a lot of great, great suggestions. Um, and I think one that, you know, folks can really hang their hat on in terms of how do you start to create actionable change within your organization? Because you can talk about things very broadly, but what I appreciate about the list is that it's very specific and it's action oriented and tactical, right? So they're easier to start to really stop, cause yourself to think about what are we doing and how are we doing it? That's really great, Eric. Thank you. Mandy, would you like to build on that? Sure. You know, one, uh, maybe taking a little bit of a different angle, 
one thing that we've been talking about um, in my organization lately is, is how do we know? You know, we, we can pretty easily measure diversity, but how do we know we're inclusive? How do we know we're moving the needle on inclusivity? And we've, you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, back to data, we're looking at data from our, you know, our organizational health and engagement surveys. Um, I think pulling in those pieces is really important to monitor as well, um, including includes, you know, inclusivity related questions in those surveys, having actual conversations with people and not just relying on the surveys. Um, is also really important. So holding focus groups and, and, and talking and understanding how people are feeling is important because you know, to answer the original question, it's not enough to just focus on diversity. You also have to think about inclusion if you wanna actually keep those people. Um, you know, we can hire all the diverse people that we like, but if, if we're not engaging and retaining them, um, then what's, you know, what's the point? back to I think another comment uh, that was made earlier which is is the work meaningful that they are working on because that's also going to go hand in glove into retention they need to feel a part of the organization they need to feel challenged um, so thank you Mandy those are great thoughts Terry yeah NCWIT actually has developed an online tool that is designed to help organizations answer this very question we have a change model that we have developed, our social science team has developed that covers the eight areas within an organization that we need to look at when we're thinking about our cultures and whether or not they're inclusive. And we have an online tool that walks organizations through that. Um, so leaders, take it's not an organizational climate survey. It's a survey that leaders take within an organization to assess how they do things, what their practices are. And the very central piece of that whole model is top leadership support. Culture is something that is set at the top of the organization. And it's really important that our leaders believe in inclusion and believe in the importance of all this. But we have a tool that actually guides organizations through this very thing. What are the questions you ask? And then depending on how you answer those questions, what are the changes you need to make as an organization to improve the, improve the inclusive culture? of your teams. Well said, well said. I first of all wanna thank each of you, Terry, Eric, and Mandy for participating in today's session. Um, each of you really shed a lot of light and brought incredible perspective and insights into a very important topic. Um, like I said at the very beginning, not only is it going to affect us in the workplace today, but for generations to come. As we learned and heard from Mackenzie as well, you know, who is new to the workforce. I am scanning the chat. I don't see a specific question per se. I do see some um, suggestions of information to share, which we absolutely will capture and um, share both um, I'm going to be capturing the key highlights from today's discussion in our blog. So I'll incorporate that there as well as a link to the recording and to Terry's presentation. Um, but if anyone has any follow-up questions, don't hesitate to reach out and then we'll work directly with the panelists to get their perspective. Um, but other than that, I just wanna say thank you again. This was incredibly insightful. 